My next guest's most recent published work is his 221st book. I haven't written that many postcards. Uh, the book is entitled Enjoy Still Felt, an autobiography. Welcome, please, Dr. Isaac Asimov. Uh, spend a minute here talking about the fact that you've written 220, 21 what? books. So far. So far. Published. Uh, is that um, a compulsive behavior, do you think? <laughs> I enjoy it. You know, why not? Sure. But I say to myself, here I am, a handsome writer. Why shouldn't I write? Yeah. <laughs> what kind of schedule do you put in to write that many books? I get up in the morning, sit down and write. When I finish writing, go back to bed. <laughs> uh, is, uh, is, is there one particular work that's a favorite for you out of uh, all of those publications? Well, yes. Uh, the one you've got right there is the second volume of my autobiography. That and the first volume, if you put them together, is my favorite book because it's my favorite subject. Well, I love yourself. Tell me a little bit about yourself. What, uh, what, uh, what would we need to know about you? Well, once you've said 221 books, that's it. What yeah. else is there? Yeah. I mean, if you sit down and write that, you haven't got time for anything else. <laughs> uh, what are you working on now? Several things. Right now, I'm working on my monthly essay for the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Mm -hmm. And when I get done with that, I will go back to one of the books I'm in the middle of. Is that your favorite topic area, science and science fiction? I suppose so, though I also like to write mysteries and like to write limericks, mm -hmm. like to write history books, like to annotate, like the Bible, Shakespeare, various other things. What exactly does that mean when you annotate the Bible? Oh, well, you simply, you simply copy down all the, all the verses in the Bible and you make little footnotes and, and, and say whatever you please about each <laughs> one. <laughs> And if, you're, if you do it right, the annotations are longer than the thing you're annotating. I've got a book coming out called In the Beginning, in which I annotate the first 11 chapters of Genesis. You can get the first 11 chapters on Genesis and maybe 15 pages or so, but the book is about 200 pages long, yeah. counting my annotations. Um, why do you think there is now uh, a real interest in, in science and uh, like these space movies, Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back? Close encounters? Oh, well, because the technology of the movie industry has reached the point where they can put in spectacular special effects, and people enjoy watching those special effects. Yeah. Did you enjoy those two movies? I enjoyed Star Wars, The Empire mm -hmm. Strikes Back. In fact, I enjoyed The Empire Strikes Back so much that when they finished it, I jumped up in my seat and yelled, Start the third part. <laughs> they, they, they have done that, haven't they? They're, they're projected like Nine. And, Nine. I, and I figure that at the rate they're going, they'll do the last few after I'm dead, which doesn't strike me as fair. <laughs> um, you know what I feel uh, is infair, unfair? Uh, at the height of the manned space projects, you know, that was great because everyone's attention was focused on that. And I wish we had something else like that to shoot for now. Do you think we uh, backed away from the manned space program at the wrong time? No, oh, yes, absolutely. The reason for that was that we had gone into space primarily to beat the Russians. So when we got to the moon, we had. Mm -hmm. And so, with true football fashion, having scored the, f the touchdown, we went home. Yeah. Uh, but the Russians are keeping right on going, and sooner or later, they'll do something spectacular, and we'll get back in the race. What do you think that that would be? What spectacular thing could we look for? Well, I suppose if they build a really large space station, or they put up their version of the shuttle and make it work while we're still fussing around with ours. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden Congress will, will pour a lot of money into it and we'll get going again. Yeah. Um, what would be the next logical step after we put a man on the moon and say we wanted to continue putting men places? <laughs> Where would we put our next man? Ah, well, we ought to stay here in the Earth-Moon system for a while and get it really developed. We have to, ought to build space stations. We ought to build space settlements, get uh, some power stations in orbit, uh, build some factories, get a mining station on the moon. And once we've got a real space civilization going, then we can explore further from a good, strong space base. 
Is, is that speaking as a science fiction writer or a, a man who has studied the needs and uh, what space can provide us? No, I think that's speaking as a real human being. Uh, have you ever uh, written about things and then seen them come true? Occasionally, yes. Uh, I described a spacewalk in 1952, and when they did it, some years later, it turned out to be exactly the way I described it. It wasn't very difficult. I described pocket computers in 1950, got the appearance exactly right. I talked about space stations getting energy down to Earth in 1940, and got that almost right. I put, the, put it in Mercury's orbit instead of the Moon's orbit to get it closer to the Sun. Maybe someday we'll do that. Mm -hmm. I predicted there'd be opposition to the space race, and there was. Yeah. So, uh, but these are little things. I never tried to predict. I just tried to write stories that would sell so I could pay my way through college. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, that whole phenomenon with, uh, phenomenon with computers and uh, digital stuff, it, uh, it used to be I could pretty well figure out any clock radio. Not so anymore. It's all advanced to the point where you really have to sit down and read the lousy book to figure these things out now. And uh, it seems like things are getting more and more complex for just getting by day to day. Well, it, it always happens that way. Things get more complex to do more, and then as the technology advances further, it gets simpler again until the next quantum jump, yeah. and then it becomes complex again. Yeah. Uh, I remember when radios first came out. See, so you're too young for that. And when radios first came out, it was next to impossible to tune them. Uh, uh, now, you, you just turn them on. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember when television first came out, you had to have a live-in television repairman. Yeah. <laughs> now, you just turn it on. If anything goes wrong with it, it means you buy a new set. Yeah. When, when the, uh, the radios did come out, they were like the size of a, of a Buick in some cases. <laughs> and now, um, you can get them just about that big. It's, uh, Unless you want to walk down the street playing at the top of the range, <laughs> then it's back to the Buick. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> It's a whole different situation here in New York City. We have to pause for a couple okay. of commercials. We'll be back with Dr. Isaac Ezra. Welcome to Dr. Isaac Asimov. Uh, talking about, among other things, his prolific uh, work as a writer. This represents 221 books published. What, uh, what kind of hardware do you have in your home to keep this thing uh, moving? Various typewriters. Yeah, That's you, about all. You just get up and wander from room to room, type a little, and then type a little, and type a little? No, there's just one typewriter, and the other three just sit there in case something happens to the one. I yeah. can grab one of the other three. Is it possible to write more than one book at a time? Well, not simultaneously, but I've got three different books in various stages. That's what I mean. Do you ever, how do you keep everything straight? Well, as long as it's nonfiction, there's no trouble. Mm -hmm. You just, or at least for me, there's no trouble. If it were fiction, I'd have to work on one book. I, I don't think I could manage two fiction books. I'd get confused in the plots. Yeah. Uh, I want to get back to talking about your feelings about new developments in certain areas. For example, okay. uh, in the next five to 10 to 15 years in medicine. Why, it seems to me that the important discoveries will be how to uh, fiddle around with genes so as to perhaps correct some of the diseases we that are congenital. Uh, maybe instead of treating diabetes with insulin, we can fix up a gene so that you make your own. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe perhaps we can get rid of some other conditions like that. How would that be administered? Do you, do you get uh, like a, an inoculation at birth or the parents get it or how would that happen? Well, I suppose that eventually we'll reach the stage where children, as born, will have a genetic analysis, and that you could then try to do something like that, graft the necessary genes into the pancreas, for instance, and hope that they'll do sufficient work to prevent the eventual development of, of the diabetes. That's a very risky area to be uh, experimenting with, isn't it? Yes, and presumably they'll do their best with animals before they try anything on human beings. Yeah. You, could, you could alter uh, or add to or detract from any characteristic of a human that way, couldn't you? Well, in theory, yes, but you know, you have to work up the technology to a high pitch of excellence, and we're just at the beginning of that now. Yeah, uh, and what, uh, what signals the beginning? What have we done so far? Well, we've been working mostly with bacteria. Mm -hmm. That's how far we are. 
and we've managed to engineer bacteria, so to speak, so that uh, particular bacteria can form chemicals that they themselves naturally wouldn't make, but we insert the genes for it, so that we can now have bacteria making human insulin. Uh, diabetics now take insulin obtained from domestic, uh, slaughtered domestic animals, which is not exactly like human insulin. It does the work, but you could, you could get allergic to it. Uh, and now we have human insulin, which we can get from bacteria. It, it, uh, have I heard correctly about a synthetic insulin, or is that what you're speaking of? Or? Well, in a sense, it's synthetic in that it's manufactured as a result of human agency, but it's exactly like human insulin, and the body can't tell the difference. Uh, what about uh, cancer research? Any breakthroughs there? Well, heaven only knows. We've been waiting for one for 30 years at least, maybe 50, and we can never we can never tell when it'll come, but uh, it isn't here yet. Yeah. Um, what about the weapons race? Well, now they keep talking about space weapons, about using about using laser beams or ion beams, things like that against satellites. And you'll have either killer satellites doing the job or stations on Earth. And uh, as long as the satellites are unmanned, I suppose it doesn't do any harm to shoot them down. Hmm. But uh, I figure that the best weapons research is no weapons research. Yeah. You don't foresee that happening, though, I guess, huh? Oh, well, I imagine that uh, I imagine that in 30 years we'll have a situation in which there won't be any wars, either that or there won't be any us. Hmm. <laughs> um, let's get to the matter of communications developments. Uh, we were unable to place a call here to Missouri on a fairly sophisticated piece of equipment. Um, y you see any monumental breakthroughs in the area of communications? Well, there are monumental breakthroughs that are underway now in terms of communication satellites and optical fibers. And I imagine that more and more we'll be using laser beams for communicating rather than either electrical currents or radio waves. And it will then be possible to have millions, literary millions, of times as many mess messages carried on a, on a wire or on a beam mm -hmm. as we now can, so that everyone can possibly have their own television channel, the way we all now have our own telephone numbers. And uh, closed-circuit television will become the great thing. And everything from education to research will be done by by way of uh, communication, communication devices. The book is called In Joy Still Felt, which is part two of your autobiography, correct? Right, part one was In Memory at Green. It had a, it's a autobiography of Isaac Asimov, 1920 to 1954, with a black border. Made my wife very nervous. She hadn't even met me in 1954. She kept saying, who's this imposter? I... Dr. Isaac Asimov, thank you very much, doctor, for being with us this morning. We're going to pause for an NBC News update. We'll be right back.